This is a Lockheed Vega. These are World War II fighters. And this is the Boeing F-18 Hornet. These aircraft span quite a bit of history, but they all share one thing in common. And we're gonna tell you in Celebrating Aviation with Mike Machat. What these airplanes and even the space shuttle have in common is they were all flown by women pilots. And this brings us to a special episode, Women in Aviation. From the early pioneers to today's accomplished women aviators. And a quick note, at this channel, we're well aware that there are many uh, international women pilots throughout history. Amy Johnson from England, Hannah Reich from Germany, Jacqueline Ariol from France, and the Soviet women bomber pilots during World War II. And these deserve mention. But what we're going to do here is uh, focus on the women pioneers and pilots today in the United States of America. And while it's impossible to include every single woman pilot of note, we're going to attempt to bring you an overview on this subject and we hope you enjoy it. We begin with Harriet Quimby. She was the first American licensed woman pilot and the first to fly across the English Channel in her Blario. She was an accomplished journalist, photographer, fashion model, screenwriter, world traveler, and an aviator who left her mark on the pioneering years of early aircraft development. She was a bit of a celebrity in her day, always wearing a purple flight suit, and she even had her image on a cigar box. Here's the first woman passenger on a scheduled commercial airline. In 1914, Mrs. Louise Whitney became a passenger on the St. Petersburg Tampa airboat line the first commercial air service in the United States. Here we have a husband and wife team, Hilda and James Smith, who flew in Southern California. Hilda first soloed in 1914, and she became the first woman to fly at Mines Field, which is better known today as LAX. She made several parachute jumps using a Glenn Curtis designed chute, and she lived to be 86 years old. Here we have Bessie Coleman, a real pioneer. She was the first African-American and Native American female pilot licensed in France by the FAI in 1921. Here she is with her Curtis Jenny and she was known as Queen Bess, a real pioneer in women's aviation. In 1929, the Women's Air Derby, better known as the Powder Puff Derby, a phrase coined by Grand Marshal Wiley Post, uh, left Cloverfield in Santa Monica for Cleveland, Ohio. And a number of the top women pilots of the day uh, entered that race. In this close-up, we see Amelia Earhart standing next to her Lockheed Vega. This is a photo of the first group of 99s. The 99s are the International Organization of Women Pilots. They were formed at a hotel in Garden City, New York, near Curtis Field, two months after the 1929 Women's Air Derby. Of the 117 licensed women pilots in the United States at that time, 99 of them attended the meeting organized by Amelia Earhart, who then became their first president. It was named the 99s in their honor. Today, there are 155 99 chapters worldwide. Standing behind Earhart is pilot Catherine Chung, the first Asian female pilot. And here we have Florence Pancho Barnes. She was uh, quite a legend. She was a movie stunt pilot, air racer. She founded the Motion Picture Stunt Pilot Association and was the only female member of that organization. In the late 1940s, she had the Happy Bottom Riding Club at Muroc, California, which was adjacent to uh, what is now Edwards Air Force Base. And that became the official watering hole for all the test pilots in the golden age of flight test, including Chuck Yeager. Her son, Billy, established an FBO in flight school at the William J. Fox Airport in Lancaster, California. And that, organ that operation is still in business today as Barnes Aviation. Well, we talked about the Lockheed Vega, and this is a replica of Amelia Earhart's Vega. Uh, the real airplane is hanging at the National Air and Space Museum in Washington, D.C. This replica is seen here at the Museum of Flying in Santa Monica, and it was a movie prop 
for the Ben Stiller movie, Night in the Museum, Battle of the Smithsonian. Here's a shot of Earhart on the airplane. Here we see Amelia uh, on a Pitcairn auto gyro. She was the first woman pilot uh, to fly an auto gyro and set world altitude records in this airplane, uh, this aircraft in 1931. Here she is with a uh, Cord Roadster and her Lockheed 10 uh, Electra. It's a nice shot by Albert Bresnik of Earhart in the cockpit. She began her flying lessons in 1921 with Netta Snook at Kinner Field near Seal Beach, California. She became the first woman to fly as a passenger across the Atlantic in a Fokker 7 in 1928, and the first woman to fly solo across the Atlantic from Newfoundland to Ireland in her Lockheed Vega in 1932, just five years after Charles Lindbergh. She was the first woman to fly coast to coast across the U.S. She made the first solo flight from Hawaii to the United States mainland. And in 1937, in her Electra, she attempted a round-the-world flight with Pan Am navigator Fred Noonan. And sadly, on the final eastbound leg across the Pacific, early in the morning on July 2nd, 1937, she and Fred vanished forever. Another pilot who uh, had her name in the papers at that time was Jacqueline Cochran. Jackie Cochran rose from a poverty-stricken childhood and founded a successful cosmetics company. But to travel to her clients faster, she learned to fly at Roosevelt Field, Long Island in 1932, and aviation became her new passion. Among her many accomplishments as a pilot, uh, she was the first woman to make a blind instrument landing. She won the Bendix Trophy in this Seversky Racer in 1938. And she founded the Women Air Service Pilots in World War II. Now, if this airplane looks familiar to you, it's because it was an ancestor to the Republic P-47 Thunderbolt. And this brings us to the women's role in World War II. As we mentioned, Cochran founded the WASPs, the Women Air Service Pilots. The WASP Corps was established in 1943 to create women pilots to fly ferry flights of badly needed combat aircraft to their allied forces overseas. From the more than 25,000 initial applicants, only 1,830 cadets were accepted, and of those, only 1,074 graduated the rigorous program. Highly skilled WASP pilots delivered more than 12,000 military aircraft through December 1944. Here we see uh, a picture taken at Plosser and Prince Air Academy at Avenger Field in Sweetwater, Texas with instructor Bill Wade and his student in a North American AT-6C Texan trainer. Wade and a number of other instructors went on to be hired as test pilots for the Vought Corporation testing the F4U Corsair. And he later went on to a distinguished career with United Airlines, retiring as a captain on the Boeing 727. In 1964, Wade made an emergency landing of a Convert 240 in California, saving the lives of 47 passenger and crew. And we're gonna bring you that amazing story later this year. He was beloved by all his students and a very highly respected instructor. Here we see Shirley Slade, a cadet at the uh, Sweetwater, uh, Texas field, uh, posing for a cover of Life Magazine as an Air Force pilot sitting on the tail of a T-6. Notice that Life Magazine cost 10 cents in 1943. These are the aircraft that the women pilots trained in. The Cessna Bamboo Bomber, Vulti Vibrator, North American Texan, and the Fairchild PT-19. Upon graduation, they flew such aircraft as the uh, B-17, B-24, B-25 Mitchell, uh, the transports, Douglas C-47, and fighters such as the Lockheed P-38 Lightning, North American P-51 Mustang, and Republic P-47 Thunderbolt. A perennial favorite of the WASP pilots was the Curtis P-40. But on the home front, there was another role, a very, very important mission uh, that was played by the uh, women in the United States during the war, and that was manufacturing. Here we see a photo uh, taken on the ramp at the Douglas Santa Monica plant and notice the ratio of women to men in this group. These were, they were building the uh, A-20 Havoc, 
and the C-47. And that uh, was where the phrase Rosie the Riveter came from. Here we see uh, a group of women and men uh, at the Douglas Long Beach plant uh, celebrating the 2000th B-17 built at Long Beach by Douglas under license from Boeing during the war effort. After the war, uh, Jackie Cochran was making headlines again with air racing in her P-51 Mustang. Uh, she won the Harmon Trophy as Aviator of the Year and became the first woman to fly supersonic in an F-86 Sabre in 1953. In 1959, she became the first woman president of the FAI Record Organization, and she sponsored the Mercury 13 Women Astronaut Program, which we're going to discuss in a moment. Here we see uh, Cochran in the cockpit of a Northrop T-38 with her friend and mentor, Colonel Chuck Yeager. In 1964, she became the first woman to fly twice the speed of sound in a Lockheed F-104 Starfighter. She was promoted to Colonel in the Air Force Reserve and she flew the T-38 for numerous altitude and time to climb records. Another woman of note was Jerry Cobb. She was the daughter of an Air Force pilot inspired to her career, and she set many world records and uh, many, made many notable flights in her Aero Commander. She was the first woman to fly at the Paris Air Show, and she qualified as one of the Mercury 13 astronauts. These were women who were fully qualified uh, and passed all the rigorous NASA tests uh, to become astronauts, although they were forbidden to fly on any missions for political reasons. Not all women who uh, contributed to aviation were in the cockpit. This is Olive Ann Beach. She was known as the first lady of aviation. She co-founded Beechcraft with her husband, Walter. And uh, upon his tragic and untimely death in 1950, she took over the company and became the first female president and CEO of a major aircraft manufacturer. This paved the way for uh, future female presidents and CEOs of major companies like Linda Hudson of BAE Systems and Marilyn Houston chairman, president, and CEO of Lockheed Martin. Commercial aviation had a special place for women as well. Of course, it was widely known and accepted that uh, in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, women primarily were stewardesses, and that uh, later went on to become the flight attendant. But in 1974, the first woman airline pilot was hired by Frontier, and that was Emily Howell, who rose to captain and flew the Boeing 737 and 727. Recently retired Captain Angela Masson flew for American Airlines. She was the first rated woman pilot on the Boeing 747, the first chief pilot on the 747, and the first female chief pilot of the airline. She was recently inducted into the California Aviation Hall of Fame. Julie Clark was a beloved air show performer, also recently retired. She flew her Beechcraft T-34 mentor named Free Spirit and was an inspiration for young women in aviation everywhere. Patty Wagstaff became the first US national aerobatic champion and today runs a flight school, inspiring and uh, mentoring young women pilots and she specializes in unusual attitude recovery for safety. Well, we talked about the WASPs and they were disbanded in uh, December of 1944, but it wasn't until 1976 that the first female US Air Force pilot class graduated 10 new Air Force pilots. These women were relegated to being instructors, flying in trainers or uh, flying tankers or transports. And it was a while before they were allowed to fly uh, tactical and strategic jet aircraft. But in 2003, the Iraq war changed that. And women such as Captain Christina Hopper, shown here, uh, flew the F-16 in combat, opening the door for women and that mission. The Navy followed suit in the mid-70s, accepting women for pilot training. But like the Air Force, they were originally uh, relegated to flying patrol or transport missions. And uh, qualifying for jets, although non-combat, uh, occurred in the 1990s. But then in the early 2000s, those doors uh, opened and Navy women pilot are flying combat missions worldwide today. Here we see Commander Sarah Joyner, 
who's a squadron commander on an F-18 carrier unit. Captain Katie Higgins, Marine Corps pilot, flies the C-130 Fat Albert for the Blue Angels, was the first woman pilot accepted for the team. And Captain Nicole Malachowski became the first female Thunderbird pilot for the Air Force. Here we see Lieutenant Colonel Merrill Tengestal, who flies the high-performance, high-altitude Lockheed U-2 at altitudes above 70,000 feet. And then there's the space shuttle, which carried America's first female astronauts. Although the Soviets had women in orbit in the early 1960s, it wasn't until 1983 that Dr. Sally Ride, a mission specialist, flew aboard the shuttle. Colonel Pam Melroy, a former test pilot at Edwards Air Force Base, uh, was one of the first female shuttle pilots. And Colonel Eileen Collins was the first shuttle commander. She made the uh, very significant first flight of the shuttle after the tragic Columbia disaster, uh, renewing America's enthusiasm in the program. Kelly Latimer flew for NASA at the Dryden and now Armstrong Research Center at Edwards Air Force Base. She was hired by Virgin Galactic and flew the 747 mothership and this aircraft, uh, the White Knight, uh, which launched just last week, the first commercial passenger space flight. She will eventually fly the uh, Virgin Galactic spacecraft and become the first commercial female astronaut. And we end with a very amazing story. This is Mary Wallace Wally Funk, one of the original 13 Mercury uh, astronauts, uh, female uh, trainees that was accepted in the Mercury 13. She graduated at the top of her class. And these 13 women, although qualified, were denied the chance to fly in space. She's the uh, surviving member of the 13 women, and she's gonna get her chance to fly in space one day after this video is recorded. She was uh, invited by uh, Amazon Jeff Bezos to uh, fly in his Blue Origin spacecraft, which as I said, will be launching tomorrow. So after waiting 60 years, 82 uh, year old Wally Funk is gonna get her chance to fly in space. So there you have it, the story of aviation and the contribution that women have made over 100 years. Here in 1912, we see Ruth Law flying a Curtis Pusher and 100 years later, we see Colonel Jamie Jameson flying the Lockheed Martin F-22 stealth fighter. Quite a dramatic comparison. And there you have it, the story of women in aviation. We hope you've enjoyed this episode of Celebrating Aviation with Mike Machat. As always, we'd like to spe especially thank uh, the people who made this uh, program possible, and we appreciate their support. Lee Pinkston Kelly, Giacinta Bradley Kuntz, and Captain John Wade. Again, we hope you enjoyed this episode. We felt it was a significant story to share. Until next time, take care.